Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Technology Officer of Amazon.com, Werner Vogels. You must have a headache. I was in pub call last night, guys. It was fun. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you all for coming out still in such, uh, such large numbers. I know many of you had, uh, had a really good time last night. I even heard there was uh, an eating contest down in the, uh, in the bowels of the, of the sports bar. And uh, someone actually ate 52 wings. Someone called Mark Fritten. Yeah, Mark, if you're here, you probably uh, are not feeling too well today. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let me give a shout out to my man, DJ Shifty from New York. Uh, probably the only DJ with a math degree from Harvard to ever win the DMC World Championship. Uh, I think he was amazing. And I love the last scratching piece of him. So um, thank you all for coming out here today. Um, we're going to talk a bit about transformations. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a crazy 10 years. And not just because uh, the kind of cloud services that we've built, but the kind of impact that we've had with cloud services. You know, when we really started off, we were really thinking about starting to help sort of internet scale companies about how the technologies that we had developed for ourselves, the principles behind that, how we could help internet scale companies be successful. That was sort of the thinking on day one. But if you look what has happened in the past year, it's not just that we've delivered these services for you, we've completely transformed the IT industry. And not just from a technology point of view, which is really cool, and we'll be talking a lot about that to, to today, but also really from a structural point of view. I, if I remember, you know, when I used to do these things as a, as a tech leader for Amazon.com, the retailer, I know how I hated, truly hated the relationship with my vendors. Why? Because I always felt that they were in charge. I was never in charge. Now, the only way to drive your costs down was to write these massive big checks up front. Yeah, and then when you've written this check, they would walk away because they didn't care anymore. And it was so counter to the culture that we had at Amazon. Yeah, because at Amazon, our motto is to be the Earth's most customer-centered company. And it's really easy to see how that works in retail. Yeah, because you have this direct relationship with your, uh, with your customers. And when we started building AWS, we vowed to ourselves to become the Earth's most customer-centric IT company. To really connect with you, our customers, to make sure that we were building the right things for you, but also that we should shift control from the IT provider to the customer. You should be in control of this whole process. Yeah? There should be no contractual obligation for you to continue to use us. We need to be on our toes every day to deliver you the absolute best service. Yeah? Because otherwise, you should be allowed to move away. Move away. There should be no legal thing for you to stick with us. Yeah, and it's great because we love to be on our toes every day to serve you. Now, what does it mean to be a uh, customer-centric IT company? Or just in general, customer centricity? Yeah, I think these are sort of the four starting points. Now, it starts off with listening to your customers. And I know that sounds cheesy. You know, every company that says that they listen to their customers. Most important, I think, with that is that you have to act on it. Now, it's not just listening. You have to act on the kind of things that your customers give you back. And probably if you look at the numbers this year, post, we we'll probably end the year with close to a thousand new major features and services. It's you that drives this roadmap. It's not us in a back room just thinking stuff up. No, it is because each of our service teams, and we have now well over 70 of them, have close relationship with their customers and allow their customers to drive their roadmap. Secondly, we're strong believers 
in giving you choice. That this means that we are not so arrogant to think that we know how you should develop, how you should build your new applications. We're really truly believing there's nobody better suited to decide how to best serve your business than you. You are customers. And as such, we build primitives. Now, we don't give you the whole kitchen sink and then tell you, this is how you shall develop software. No, we give you primitives. We give you a toolbox where you can pick exactly from, from the kind of things that you need. Yeah, and we've well over 70 services at this moment, and who knows how many we'll have at the end of this day. Yeah. It's really clear that you are in charge of what technology you need to want to use. Yeah, so we end up with a very broad and deep set of services which give you choice. And I think it's one of the biggest differentiators between AWS and, and other providers, yeah, that we give you choice. You get to pick exactly the right tool for the job. And we work backwards from you. That's the strategy we have. You know, we really start with you. I spend a lot of my time in offices of our customers, really listening to, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are we building the right products? Yeah. What are still the pain points that you have when you build applications and when you run your systems? Are we building the right things there? Yeah, and then take that back and really focus on the pain points that our customers still have. Yeah? I once said, just jokingly, that we're in the business of pain management. Yeah? Really helping you remove the pain points so that you can focus on building those things that you want to build. And I think it's not just that we have transformed the IT industry. Many of our customers are transforming their world as well. Yeah? And it is our duty almost, that in this changing world of how we're changing the development, to really help you, educate you, bring best practices to you, work closely together with you, give you solution architects that can come on premise with you and help you be successful on this platform. That's absolutely part of our mission, to really service the best practices from around the world and bring them to you so that you can also be successful on this platform. I actually think there is a, uh, there's a line that should go before this. There is a level zero responsibility that we have as a customer-centric company, and that is to protect you at all cost. This is our number one priority, and it will be forever our number one priority to make sure that you and your business and your customers are protected on our platform. On one hand, we do that from an operational perspective. We are responsible for security of the cloud. And we also innovate very rapidly to make sure that you have the tools so that you can protect your customers and your business in the cloud. And we'll talk more about that later to, to in this keynote. Yeah, so going back to transformations, it's then cool to see that all the things that we've built and that we're doing both from a technology and a business perspective help others, help other customers on our platform be successful as well and be, become transformers, now really transforming their business. And we've had some earlier customers that grew up on our platform totally disrupting traditional uh, verticals, yeah, whether it's healthcare or life sciences or telecommunications, for example. And I think there's absolutely no bigger success story this year in tech than one of our very successful transformers, our very trans successful companies on our platform, and that is Twilio. Uh, Twilio had their IPO this year, but which clearly signaled to the rest of the world that a young business, a young, fast-growing business on top of the cloud can disrupt a very traditional segment of the market. So I'm very happy uh, that one of our great friends is here today to talk to you about how they grew up on AWS. Jeff Lawson, co-founder and chief executive officer and chairman of Twilio. Please, Jeff, come on stage.
great to be here today. Thank you very much, Werner. So, uh, hi there, I'm Jeff. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Twilio. I'm a software developer, but more than that, I consider myself to be a software person. See, it's not that I write code, it's that I like using software to build competitive advantage in the businesses that I'm involved in. Because I believe that software is a mindset. It is not a skill set. And I've used that mindset throughout my career. See, before starting Twilio, I had started three companies, and I was one of the first product managers at Amazon Web Services, back when Andy hired all the PMs. Hey, Andy. Um, and after Amazon, I set out to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I looked back at my three previous businesses and realized that I had two things in common between all of them. First was that we were using that software mindset, the agility of software to enable competitive differentiation, sprint after sprint, listening to our customers, and shipping an iteratively better product. That is the superpower of software. But I also realized that at each of these companies, we had needed communications to make a great customer experience. And when we turned to the legacy communications industry to find out how we should build the things we had in mind, we got the same answer every time. Sure, wire up all these copper wires to your data center, rack up a bunch of telco gear, and then bring in professional services to come and integrate that whole thing for you. And that'll take millions of dollars and take 24 months before we can launch anything. I said, wow, that is the complete opposite of that software mindset. And so in 2008, we started Twilio to solve this problem, to bring communications into the era of software and out of its legacy based in hardware and physical networks. And we had a mission. That mission is to fuel the future of communications because communications is going to be powered by software. And we do this with a product we invented called a cloud communications platform. See, we have all the building blocks for communication that you would need to build any kind of communications use case you can imagine. Programmable voice, messaging, video, wireless, authentication, and many more. And you can use these building blocks to assemble just about any use case you can imagine. And if you've never used Twilio yourself, that's OK. You probably use Twilio all the time, and you don't even know it. Because when you hail an Uber and you call the driver from inside the app, you're actually using Twilio. If you make a dinner reservation at OpenTable, and you get a text message when your table is ready, you're using Twilio. If you get a two-factor authentication code texted to you from Box or many other online services, you're actually using Twilio. That's because these companies are also using that power of software to build a better product every day. And you know, we started in 2008 helping companies in nearly every industry you can imagine migrate workloads of communication from the legacy into this new way in the cloud and using software. And every time we go through a big scaling effort and we think, wow, that was hard, guess what? It just gets harder. Because there's more and more and more workloads of communication that are migrating to the cloud and to software. And new use cases and new workloads getting invented all the time. In fact, one example is a category we call cloud scale communications. If you think about the gold standard of enterprise legacy communications, it's the call center. And the largest call centers on the planet, run by the likes of American Express, other financial services companies, they're on the scale of about 8,000 agents, or the biggest ones there are. They handle about 100 million interactions annually. This is the pinnacle of legacy communications. But today, this has all changed. Because the on-demand economy has changed the nature of what it means to be cloud scale. You don't have 8,000 agents, you have half a million drivers talking to their riders. And you don't have 100 million interactions annually, you have billions of interactions annually. This is cloud scale communications. And that old way where you'd go and rack up PBXs, you can't get to cloud scale by racking up boxes. You know, it used to be you'd, you'd put this thing in a closet and you'd wait five years to amortize it before you could do anything new. That doesn't help you when you're scaling rapidly. That doesn't help you when you're trying to reach customers all around the world in a very rapid fashion. That doesn't help with your velocity of innovation. In fact, you get no agility whatsoever from the legacy approach, and it's only as reliable as you make it yourself. But as software people, we know that agility is the most important thing. That's why at Twilio, we shipped production updates of Twilio almost 8,000 times in the last year. 
almost, you know, more than 30 times a day, Twilio gets better. But the thing is, some people believe the reason why you'd you know, not be agile is because you need reliability. But that's a misconception. Because with software and processes and smart systems, you can build agility with resiliency. And that's how Twilio approaches this. So despite the fact that we shipped 8,000 times in the last year, we have five nines availability of our API. And that's the power of software. You can have it all. And we know this is important to you as a company founded by developers for developers. We have over one million developers in our ecosystem. And the apps built by these developers process over 100 billion annual API requests to power those communications. And those communications have reached over one billion devices around the planet. And that's the power of platforms working together. Since day one of Twilio, back in 2008, we've been building on top of Amazon Web Services. And we're working together with AWS to take on 150 years of legacy communications. Like many of you, we started back in 2008 launching our first uh, EC2 machine, and now we boot over 100,000 instances annually. But it doesn't stop with EC2 because as Amazon has shipped, we've adopted many of their services, Kinesis, ELBs, Availability zones all around the world, Lambda, Redshift, Dynamo, Direct Connect, to build a better product all the time. As we've expanded our operations and our customer base globally, AWS has allowed us to expand much faster than we ever could have before. But it's not just Twilio using AWS. AWS is also using Twilio. If you use the simple notification service, those SMS messages are powered by Twilio. If you use Amazon Lex, which they launched yesterday, we're really excited to be a part of that solution. And we're really excited to announce some upcoming collaborations soon. And we power this because of the super network that we've built around AWS. Now, I say it's super not just because it's amazing, which we kind of think it is, but really more in the literal sense of the word super. It's a network that is sitting above the carriers of the world and it optimizes them with software. See, we've taken the AWS network, and we've deployed our software into all these regions and all these AZs all around the world, and then we've interconnected that software with hundreds of carriers and expanded the AWS edge, and we're growing that list of carriers every day, and then we use data and feedback from our customers to continually optimize the performance of this network for quality, for delivery, for latency, for every text message and phone call that traverses our network. It's a flywheel that's getting better every single day. See, what we've done is we've turned AWS into a low latency, adaptively learning, globally interconnected communications cloud. And coupled with our programmable communications APIs, it is a powerful toolkit to power any kind of communications workload you can imagine. But the point is, in 2016, you no longer get points for merely using servers. You only get points for serving your users. Companies that win are companies that ship software. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, being such an inspiring story. And I know many of you aspire uh, as a business to the same uh, sort of goals, the same disruptive goals that Twilio has had. And I love um, the statement that Jeff made that, you know, building, building software is a mindset. It's not a skill set. Right? It's really, it's how you think about building so solutions. And you know, how you get to transform. Uh, how you get to transform um, your, your business, how you get to transform the way that you build uh, your applications, and how you actually sort of get to transform your customers again. And as Andy said yesterday, you know, AWS gives you these superpowers. And I think we use these superpowers to transform the way, to disrupt the way that we are uh, building our applications and delighting our, our customers. Yeah? And our goal at AWS is 
to actually make you a transformer. Yeah, so when you walk away today, I hope, from my keynote, you not only feel that you'll have superpowers, but you can apply those superpowers to become a transformer, to really sort of make a difference in your business and in the world of IT. Now, where can we help you? Uh, I think there are sort of three different areas um, where transformation plays a very important role driven by, by cloud. On one hand, that's that on the way that we develop things, that we operate, uh, DevOps and approach and uh, technologies around that. Then the role of data, the competitive role of data in our, in, in our businesses. And then, of course, we need to do things with that data. So let's talk then at the end sort of about com compute. Yeah? And, and believe me, you won't get any diesel fumes in my talk, yeah? although it was really cool. I do urge you, however, to stick around, because you never know what's happening in the last five minutes of an AWS keynote. Yeah? But you can fall asleep before that if you want to. Yeah? So let's first tack on the first thing. Yeah, I think a very underestimated part of our work, of the kind of things that we do on a daily basis, is that of development, testing, and operations. Yeah, we, we often all talk about how we're building applications and the kind of things that customers are doing with the applications. There's a lot of work that goes in before that. Uh, to really build a sort of agile, fast-moving business, you really have to focus on that part, much more than on the production side of things. Uh, and I think development is rapidly changing. And why? Because you can no longer afford to build two years or three years and then release something to your customers only to find out that that's something that they no longer want. Uh, so to reduce the risk in your business, you have to move faster. You have to build smaller, more targeted applications or features in applications, get them faster to your customers, see what they're doing with it, get that feedback from your customers, and then sort of react to that, adapt, work closely with our customers. It has worked really well for us, and I believe it should work really well for you as well. It allows you to become more experimental. And remember, this is a quote from, uh, from another Jeff, not Jeff Lawson, but Jeff Bezos, who says that if you already know the outcome, it's not an experiment. Uh, so don't play it safe. Go into new areas, because you can move really fast and really adapt really quickly to the changes that your customers are requesting from, from, from you. And I do think that in all of this, all of this agility, yeah, it lives in dev and test. It doesn't live in production. Production is stuff that is stable, yeah, that you want to run, that you want to make sure it is reliable, secure, and it continues to run without being touched. Yeah? Dev and test is where agility lies. And I have a little bit of a beef with some of the media that will say, oh, no, those are not serious workloads. It's just dev and test. You know what? Dev and tests are the most important workloads in your business. That's where your agility lies. That's where you can, do it. That's where you can be experimental. Yeah? And so I think with cloud, we've completely, radically changed the way that you can do that dev and test. Right? We have unconstrained resources for you. You want to run five projects in parallel? Yeah? You're no longer constrained by any resources. I've seen that testing has changed dramatically. I don't know if you've ever uh, worked with uh, your Q&A uh, engineers. In the old world, they would have the worst hardware available, old hardware. Yeah? And then they would have to test against five different databases, a, a well-working one, an empty one, a broken one. And so they would have to re-image things all the time. In the cloud, you no longer are constrained by that. We see getting feedback from our customers say that the testing that they do is with much higher fidelity than they could ever do in the old, in the old constrained world. And we see with all of this, because dev and test is so very well supported on the cloud, we see major productivity improvements. We've heard from some of our larger customers, larger enterprises even, that will say that their, their engineers see a productivity improvement to T, two or three X of before that they moved into cloud. 
I just spoke to a CIO yesterday who said that he had, uh, he had, gone, he had interviewed a new uh, director of engineering. And the director of engineering had said that he didn't want to come and work for him if they were not in cloud, because he would not be able to move fast anymore. Being able to own cloud means that you can hire the absolute best people today. I actually want to shout out to anybody who's taken uh, the effort in the past days to get certified here on premise. I know how hard it is. These are very hard, very hard exams to take, but they're really important uh, and a really important part of the future of your career. So thank you all for actually taking that, that effort. Um, a part, what I said earlier, it's really important for us to service best practices to, to you. Yeah, to really understand how have companies like Twilio become successful on a platform and what can you learn from that. And it's not just us, actually, that service those best practices. Uh, our partners at Heroku have uh, put uh, sort of the 12-factor app together. Uh, if you've never seen this, this is sort of best practices around building, um, around building web applications. And, and there's some really, really good, cool stuff in the 12 steps that they suggest for you. Most of that is really around your development environment. How should you think about it? How do you think about dependencies? How do you think about configuring your app? How to separate code from uh, configurations, for example? Really cool stuff in there. Um, check it out. Also, and I talked about this last year, we are start, have started to collect sort of your best practices, your experiences into uh, a framework that we've called the well-architected framework. And we've gone much deeper this year on the well-architected framework. Uh, we've, if you go to uh, the, last year, it was still one document. There's now four documents with very deep, detailed information and questions that you should ask yourself. We have a whole program around it with solution architects that can help you sort of review your architecture from a well-architected framework point of view. So there's still four pillars in there. Security, reliability, yeah, how to get um, consistent performance, and how to control cost. Yeah, and each of them have much deeper content this year. We've also added a very important fifth pillar to it, which is operational excellence. Yeah, what are the best practices of operating on AWS, both at the development and testing phase, as well as on the production phase? And so um, we've launched a lot of new content in the Well-Architected Framework course. Uh, there's lots of videos. There's a course available for you, how to best make use of these documents, how to see them, how to take them into your organization, and how to make sure that you're well-architected. Yeah, I think this is extremely important. And it's whether, regardless whether you're a young business that is just starting or whether you're an existing enterprise, the way that that AWS has transformed the way that you're doing development requires you to actually take a look at this framework to make sure that you can operate in the absolute best way on this. I want to take a look at, uh, at operational excellence, actually, because I think it is such a crucial part of the way that we're building and, and actually running our systems. Yeah, and I think so that there's always three different phases in there. You know, the stuff that you do up front, yeah, sort of prepare, the things that you do in operating, and I think operations is not just running your production system. I think operations actually is the whole chain, from how do you build code, how do you, how do you deploy it, how do you test it. That whole piece, given that that's where your agility lies, is part of, uh, of operations. And then there are both planned events and unplanned events. And so you need to respond to, to those. What do you do? with them. Yeah, and so let's dive in each of those. One theme that you will see coming back in all of this is around automation. Yeah, and as, uh, as creative as we are as engineers, we sometimes are too creative. Yeah, and I think there's many, many tasks that if you want to improve security, if you want to improve reliability, you need to automate those human tasks. Yeah? Also for efficiency reasons sometimes. Sometimes you need to take five or ten steps in response to an event. If you can automate those five steps, it's much faster and much more reliable. I think a part of, uh, part of prepare 
is sort of that you make just checklists. Yeah? It starts off with security in my eyes. You start making checklists. Uh, security needs to be your day zero thinking. How am I going to keep my system secure? How can I make sure that our development procedures meet, for example, regulatory requirements? And I know regulatory requirements is something that we in the past used to think that was something that belonged to the big enterprises. The thing that cloud has done has created the ability for many young companies to enter into competitive businesses that are highly regulated, whether that is uh, healthcare or, for example, financial services. Yeah? Companies, new banks like Simple or Mondo or Number 29 yeah? or Robinhood, which is into the, uh, um, into the stock market uh, uh, efforts. And so all of those are well-regulated areas. And new companies are allowed to go into that. To be able to meet the regulatory requirements, you need to be aware up front what you need to do in your processes. You need to think about sort of what are, my, uh, what are the actions that operators still need to take and what are the targets in there? What are the targets that you can automate? Uh, and then you have to define your operational environment. So your testing environment, your A-B testing, your pre-production, all those areas. And one important tool in all of this has become CloudFormation. That CloudFormation gives you a, uh, a, a way to describe your environment, how you want to execute in it. And the CloudFormation tool, the team, has worked really hard this year. Yeah, I think they've added 20 new services. They've updated 20 existing services that they were covering. They provide you with YAML support. And so, and for example, chain sets, how you can see how two of these sets actually that you've created, have, the changes have become. Uh, I like the way that they are now protecting stack creation and say, stack management through IAM, so that you can get really tight control over who is allowed to actually make changes to your execution environment. And they produce resource schema, so you can get third-party uh, uh, tools that are actually operating on uh, the schemas that, uh, that uh, CloudFormation actually gives you. Many of our customers are using um, cookbooks, yeah, chef cookbooks, for uh, managing their environment, yeah, both in terms of uh, preparing their environment as well as updating their environment. And so it's very popular. But we did, did hear from many of our customers that there are, there's quite a bit of heavy lifting still around uh, chef and that they actually find it bothersome to sort of keep a chef server up and running, yeah, making sure that it's always patched, making sure that it's always running, that it's restarted if it might fail or that even the environment might fail. And that's actually quite a bit of work to have your clients figure out where the chef server is. So we decided to solve that, and the AWS OpsWorks team has uh, built AWS OpsWorks for Chef Automate, which gives you a fully managed chef server, meaning that you can update, they, they will update the chef server for you, They'll make sure it's patched. They'll make sure the operating system is patched. They will restart it if there may be issues with it. And they'll give you an automated way to actually connect your client um, back to the server to discover it. Yeah, so I think this has been one of the smaller but very important pain points for customers that make use of uh, chef cookbooks to configure their environments. There's often much more that you have to do in your environment. Yeah? Much more of the system level things, making sure your operating system is always patched, making sure that you understand if you have a large fleet of instances, how many of them are actually running a particular version of software, and whether that is, uh, let's say, operating system patches or whether it's system libraries, it's, it's a pain. Yeah? System management at some levels is still a pain. And so we decided to help you out there by uh, releasing uh, Amazon EC2 Systems Manager which is a, uh, a collection of AWS tools that helps you with packaging the installation, with patching your operating systems, um, making sure that you have an understanding of the inventory levels. Yeah, what are the, what is all the machines that I'm running? What is the patch levels of those machines? What are the things that I still have to do? Uh, and making sure that you can remain in compliance, for example, uh, that uh, with compliance regulations that you may have. Yeah, so I think those two things help you with taking away some of the pain points that you have around uh, system management. As I said earlier on, I believe that operations includes the way that you develop software. Yeah, and 
we've seen a great advantages with many of our customers that are going through continuous delivery. Basically, uh, yeah, and uh, I think we just heard it from Jeff, how they are doing that. But that most of our customers who want to move fast go to continuous integration and continuous delivery model. Yeah, and again, if you have these smaller changes, you reduce risk. Yeah, if you have to deploy 15,000 lines of code, it is sometimes pretty hard to figure out what kind of the, uh, the effects of that code are. Or, for example, if you want to do security checks, yeah, on 50,000 lines of code, that's hard. If it's six lines of code, it's much easier to do a security va uh, validation on those six lines of code. And so we see very rapid development happening. And so in continuous integration and continuous delivery, let's take a look at what sits actually in that pipeline. Yeah, so on one hand, you have your source environment, you'll have your build environment, and then you do deep deployment. And uh, I want to refer back to the uh, 12 factor app there's some great advice uh, that the Heroku guys give on if you're building web apps about exactly how you can configure these individual stages um, in your mindset, in your software mindset, how to use environment variables to make differentiations, for example, between how the same code can operate and execute in different environments. Really take a look at that. So two years ago, we already started releasing tools here for you to help you with, with this. Now, on one hand, um, we started with AWS Code Commit, which gives you a Git compliant environment. Yeah, and on the other hand, we'll give you Code Deploy, yeah, which is the ability to deploy your code at scale reliably to very large scale environments. And with all of this, we have AWS Code Pipeline to actually coordinate these steps for you. But it's obvious that there is still a piece missing in all of this, of course. So I'm very excited today to announce AWS Code Build, which is a fully managed build service yeah, that can continuously scale, that will run unit tests for you, and that uh, you can integrate into your continuous development pipeline. Yeah, and it's <coughs> <coughs> I know it's early. Relax. Uh, You'll get excited about this when you get back to your workstation. Yeah? And so it's really important, I think, uh, because what, the way that we've built this is actually that you only pay by the minute, and it's, it's auto-scaling for you. Yeah? No matter whether you want to run one build test, one build and test, how many uh, unit tests you, you want to run, how often you want to use it, and you actually only pay by the minute that you're using this build environment for you. It's also extensible. Now, quite a few will be, uh, uh, will be, you know, maybe developing in some more esoteric languages. Uh, and so for that, you can just create a Docker image with your build tools in it, point uh, AWS code build to that Docker image, and we will execute that as part of the build steps for you. So it's extensible. I think with, with all of these together, yeah, we now have a complete set of tools for you that are native on AWS. Yeah, code commit, code build, code deploy, and code pipeline to coordinate this for you. And I, uh, I urge you to take your time and really start playing with these tools because they are cloud native and will help you really improve and accelerate the way that you're doing deep development. So let's, let's take another step. In, in operate. Uh, it's, of course, very important for you to manage and to get visibility into how you're running your systems. And we've had these tools for quite a while. Uh, so each of them have been evolving very rapidly, yeah? whether it's metrics, whether it's events where you can base alarming on, whether it's CloudWatch logs that allow you to aggregate your logs from different places, inspect them, and build, again, alarms on those. Or whether it's CloudTrail. CloudTrail has really been on fire this year. Increasingly, every, almost every service within AWS now is CloudTrail enabled. Allows you to actually really be in levels of compliance and, for example, interact with your auditors in ways that you never were able to do before. The fine grain level of access uh, uh, tracking and auditing is amazing. 
in, in CloudTrail. And we'll get back to that later in the keynote to look at some of different services, how that's happening there. It's a very important tool for you. Important is that you also can alarm on it and that you can take automated actions because of it. I think uh, one of the things that uh, CloudTrail Metrics did uh, last week, I believe, was a release that allows you to focus on percentages. Yeah, where you can now alarm on if the 99.9 .9 percentile of your distribution is being crossed, for example. Very, very important. Uh, looks very small, but I think it's very important and will help you truly with monitoring your systems. But metrics and, and auditing is somewhat on the outside of your application. Yeah? Sometimes if things not going completely right, not completely the way that you were thinking your application should perform, or the kind of latency that your customers are getting, which you're getting out of, out of uh, CloudWord metrics, for example. Sometimes you need to grab much deeper into your application, especially if your application is built of multiple different components. There are some VMs, there are some containers which you're running, maybe some Lambda functions, uh, you're accessing DynamoDB, you're using SES for sending emails. Your applications are becoming pretty complex. They're a web of services, a web of components connected together. And with these metrics, you can only look at the outside. You can't really look inside in. For that, you need X-ray vision. You need X-ray vision to dive into the application, to see inside your application. And I'm very excited to announce today AWS X-ray which is a fully managed uh, service that allows you to debug your uh, distributed applications in detail, diving really inside the application to see how all the components are working together. And so it allows you to analyze and debug your distributed apps in production. Yeah, you can visualize call graphs. Yeah, you can see exact where performance bottlenecks are. You can pinpoint individual services that may be giving you issues, and you can get really see a good view on the impact of issues of, for your users that are using your application. So let's take a look at it. Yeah, so this is something that you, it's one of the views that you can get in AWS X-Ray. Yeah, um, the visualization here is about HTTP error codes or HTTP status codes that you're getting back. If they're green, they're either 200s or 300s. If they're yellow, um, they are uh, 400s. If they're 500, they're red. And so what you see here, here are customers, here are clients that actually is exiting your app. And you'll see that the DynamoDB instance over there is probably something that you haven't configured correctly with the right, um, with the right throughput. And as such, it's throttling, um, throttling the requests. Now, the cool thing is with X-Ray, next to getting this sort of distributed graph, is that you can dive into them to look at each of the performance. So if we, let's dive into one of those. Yeah, you can get exact latencies on how each of those calls are being made uh, between the different components. And then again, you can dive deeper into those. You can really drill into it. And what you see here is sort of the, uh, the latency of individual requests within each of those. Um, Beanstalk calls over there, calls DynamoDB. You'll see that that one takes 800 milliseconds. You then really are able to dive deep into each of those to see exactly where your timing is going. Or, for example, and what kind of actions you need to take uh, because of this. I think this is just really amazing. Uh, it gives you insight. It gives you X-ray vision into your applications that you have never had before. Yeah? And this is... Um, it's one of the coolest releases uh, that I could ever think of, and I'm really proud of the team that has built this for you. Now, that's building, yeah? operating and building. Sometimes things don't really go as planned. Yeah? Or, or maybe they do go as planned, and there's some reactions that you have to take, but mostly it's all about that things do not really go as planned. You need to prepare yourself. You need to have a playbook ready yeah? for both is both for scenarios that you think can happen, yeah, as well as sort of these completely scenarios that are out of the box that you couldn't think about at all before. Real-time alarming plays a really important role in this, yeah, so you can get those alarms. Really think about what would be canaries in your 
uh, app application, yeah? Sometimes there's one or two sort of metrics that you can really focus on to really indicate whether your overall system is healthy or not, and really track those. An interesting one at Amazon Retail, forever we've been looking at these canaries. We had a canary from day one, which was number of orders a minute. And we've been forever looking at whether we had more, more interesting canaries. But whenever the number of expected orders a minute actually had some variation in it, a drop, for example, that was often an indicator of other issues happening within the system. You wouldn't know where. But that was really a good flag to actually track that. We've been looking at other things, like, like leading trails, like 500s giving back to customers and things like that. But there has never been a better canary than what we call the expected orders. From, from customers. And so you put all your alarming around that. Then important it is to build automated responses around it. Yeah, because some of these are just painful. In the case of, of, uh, of Amazon the retailer, for example, we have one operator that is, that is tracking uh, these orders a minute. If there is a particular order drop, he will push one button. That one button will set up a call, Twilio, will create a ticket, will put the telephone number of that ticket, in the ticket, we'll put the initial graphs in there, all of that with one push of a button. And then you automate also the, the escalation path. Yeah, how within sort of half an hour, if this ticket hasn't been resolved with the current people involved, you might actually automatically escalate this. So automation plays a very important role in, in, all, in all of this. And for that, to be able to automate, we need to give you the right, um, the right tools, the right information to be able to react to, 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 to that. And we've come to the realization that we're giving you with CloudWatch metrics um, and CloudWatch logs most of that information, but we needed something more. Yeah, there's things happening in the AWS environment that we need to notify you about. It might be, for example, and some of you may have seen this email before, that, we, that there may be hardware de degrading, that we suggest that you move your instance to somewhere else. And so those system events, are now available to you for what we call an AWS personal health dashboard. Yeah. It's a personalized view of all regions, all AZs, all the things that you're running there, and all system events that will happen in that environment. Yeah, for example, if an RDS instance is failing over, we will notify you in an automatic manner for this, for this uh, uh, chat channel. And it allows you to also, in this health dashboard, you can write Lambda functions to actually respond to these system events. So it's extensible. You can automate your responses to system events happening within AWS. I want to come back to uh, a point I made all the way at the beginning. Yeah? Protecting your customers and your business should be your priority number one. I really, really believe that you have no business on the internet if you do not make protecting your customers and your business your number one priority, you really are putting your business at risk. And it starts in the earliest phases. It really starts that you have to build security in from the ground up. And there's a whole section to the AWS website that is targeted to something that we call security by design, where on day one, you have to start thinking about how am I going to protect my customers? How am I going to um, you know, encrypt that personal identifiable information? How am I going to do key rotations? And all the tools that we have there for you to support security by design. So it allows you to build secure applications from the ground up. In security, automation plays a very important role as well. Yeah, it's really, really able to react to security events in a very fast manner. Yeah, and for example, we've already given you uh, the web application firewall, which is a, a feedback mechanism to, uh, from your applications to AWS to provide us with ACLs that we can then block content or access at the edge uh, towards uh, your uh, web applications. Or I think Amazon Inspector plays a very important role in your continuous integration and development pipeline, the deployment pipeline, if you're subject to certain regulatory requirements. So uh, Amazon Inspector yeah, compares your environment against a number of li library with well-known uh, uh, requirements around uh, 
um, compliant. You know, whether you need to be SOX compliant or PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant, there's a whole set of libraries. And then if you do continuous delivery and continuous updating of your software in your environment, Amazon Inspector can check for you whether you still are in compliance. So automation plays a very important role in security. I do know that there is one particular threat model that probably all of us are very much concerned about, certainly in the past year. And that is that of denial of service attacks. Now, I think we see major impact this year of denial of service attacks, whether it's to individual customers or whether it's to particular pieces of our infrastructure, which the, of, of general infrastructure is then sort of trickles out towards customers again. And so if you take a look at sort of what are the different threat models that there are, or the different, different patterns that we see, these are sort of the, the, the standard layers of your networking stack uh, that may be attacked through the denial of service attacks. Yeah? It starts with volumetrics attacks, which is basically trying to flood the pipe, yeah? trying to take your network capabilities away. Um, and it can be at the lowest level of your network, but it could also be, for example, for UDP reflection attacks. The second level, second type of attacks that you'll see are those of state exhaustion attacks. Uh, that really attack the state machine of a particular uh, protocol to really get sort of explosions of state inside your operating system or inside your router. A well-known approach there, of course, is TCP SYN attacks. Basically, the first package arrives there, but other package will never. But it actually creates state for every new TCP connection, exhausting all resources at your, uh, at your machines or at your routers. And then, the more complex ones, sophisticated ones, happen at application level. Yeah, sort of really the level seven DDoS attacks. And if you look at sort of the kind of things that we see around the world, the majority of attacks are volumetrics attacks, about 65%. And then close to 20% is uh, state exhaustion attacks, the TCP SYN-like ones. And then a certain percentage, a small, much smaller percentage, is that that really is very sophisticated, targeting you at level seven at your HTTP get level, for example. Or some of those are even DNS attacks. It's very important for you. It's something that is of great concern to us as well. And as such, we built for you AWS Shields that protects you all from volumetrics and state attacks. This is turned on by default. Yeah, you all get protected against most, all volumetrics attacks, most of state attacks, and a number of the application level attacks. Because you can combine this one, what we call shield standard, uh, with the web application firewall to actually protect yourself at level seven. Some of you may be concerned about very large attacks or very sophisticated ones. And for those, we give you Shield Advanced, which gives you access to our 24-7 DDoS response and support team and helps you then build ACLs that actually can keep even the most sophisticated level seven attacks out at the edge. Yeah? It also gives you um, what is called sort of cost protection. If you make use of ELB and CloudFront and Route 63, if you're then subject to a denial of service attack, we will cap the costs that we, we will protect you from exorbitant costs that may happen at that particular level. It is all triggered by uh, getting advanced notification for any, of these event, uh, for any of these events that are happening through CloudWatch. Yeah, so basically what's happening, you get an advanced notification through CloudWatch that we are notified, seeing something on the network. You will work then together with our DDoS protection team to create the right levels of protection at level seven using WAF. And then we'll also keep a good eye on the cost, making sure that you don't occur any additional cost by using our services. I think this will really help you, uh, you know, protect yourselves even against the largest and most sophisticated attacks that we've seen out there. So all of this helps you really transform the way that you operate really your operational excellence. It helps you become more secure, build more secure applications, protect yourself, your business, and your customers. It becomes more reliable. 
you get good control over reliable performance. You know that you're well operated, that you have all these alarms and responses in place to protect yourself, and all with very good cost control. Yeah, and so this helps you transform the way that you're running your business. And you know, it's not just for, let's say, the fast-moving internet companies that are really going through these transformations. It's also traditional companies that are moving, starting to move really fast, that are actually making use of continuous integration and continuous development to move from a traditional enterprise to a very fast-moving one. And uh, there is no cooler story uh, that I've heard lately uh, than that of Trainline, where we have uh, Chris Turvel from Trainline, their head of cloud, they will talk to you about how AWS has helped them completely revolutionize their business and become more agile. Chris. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Turvel. I'm delighted to be here to talk about Trainline's cloud and DevOps migration journey over the last 18 months. So let me start with this. Train travel in Europe is huge. It's about 15 times the size of um, the US market, and it's growing rapidly. Trainline are the number one independent rail ticket retailer across Europe. So we serve 24 countries, and we help 100,000 customers every single day make smarter journeys. And that's what we're really passionate about, is using technologies to make the travel experience awesome for our customers. Our turnover is about $3 billion in ticket sales. And we are about 17 years old, so we're not a born in the cloud startup. We've been around a while. Our business focus at the moment is two main things. One, massive growth across Europe. And two, a faster time to market. And we were fortunate about 18 months ago to be bought by KKR, one of the world's most successful and tech savvy private equity companies. And together, we've been setting ourselves some quite ambitious targets. And what became clear was that the reality of our tech stack was not up to those ambitions. So we had a number of slow-moving physical data centers. And we also had a huge amount of waste in our development process, mainly due to environmental snowflakes and instability, which led to a lot of delays and waste. The reason we chose AWS um, to help us solve those technical problems was not just the range and depth of the feature set, but it was also about the pace of innovation. So we want to use Amazon's speed of innovation to help us innovate faster for our customers as well. These were the top four considerations for our migration. Number one, as always, is security. So we're a PCI level one certified organization. So we take online security and customer privacy very, very seriously indeed. Secondly was performance. We know if our website responds just 0.3 of a second slower, it costs us $10 million in our revenue. Uh, in terms of cost, we want to channel our money to our developers writing cool features for our customers, uh, not maintaining physical infrastructure. That's not our business. And finally, we had a lot of problems with our legacy system. So we had a big monolithic application architecture, and we had a number of nasty old technologies lurking around as well. So we had some biz talk, and we even found a VB6 application in the dark recesses of the code base where you're not meant to look. Uh, our migration plan went like this. So the first thing we did is we put 75% of the company through classroom training on AWS so that they were familiar with it and it sort of demystified the process. Because a change like this is, is fundamentally about humans and the emotion of that change. So managing that was very important. We also got AWS professional services in to help us just shape the initial architecture. The next thing we did was look at our core infrastructure. So we built and automated that. And we put in place some basic standards so that when the applications were migrated in, there was some consistency in how those were done from the start. We then migrated our application services one at a time through dev staging and into production, um, dealing with all the easy ones first, and then eventually getting to the um, big database that we had to migrate. That had to be done as a big bang. So everyone, including Amazon, actually came in at midnight to help us with that. Uh, this whole process took about nine months, the bulk of the migration. A word on the Oracle migration. We were running it on an Oracle Exadata, and we've actually, with a bit of tuning, been able to make it run in AWS 10% faster 
and obviously significantly cheaper than it was on the hardware as well. The biggest benefit of this, though, is that we now have a spare Exadata server that our CTO can use as a site table. Um, although he has threatened to throw it in the river a couple of times, so he may well do that. Um, so where does that leave us now? So we are now massively more agile uh, as a company. Instead of doing one big platform release every six weeks, we're now doing 150 production deployments a week. And um, we're doing that because each change is very small. It's tested and deployed automatically. It's closely monitored with tools like New Relic. And it's easy to roll back because everything's done with blue, green, or canary deployments. So if there is a problem, we can just click a button, and within a few seconds, it toggles back. Another nice side effect is that we've got 60% more reliability since we went to continuous delivery. So this speed is not the expense of reliability or security or performance. It's a genuine improvement to our efficiency thanks to being on AWS and thanks to the automation tools that we put on top of that. So one of our big secrets um, is a tool we've written called Environment Manager. And that's what allows us to maintain this speed with good governance and good control. Basically, it's a framework for managing continuous delivery in AWS. Um, but the big difference is that it's unopinionated. It doesn't care if it's Windows or Linux. It doesn't care if it's single or multi-tenancy. It doesn't care if it's mutable, immutable, and so on. It's a very flexible tool. So we can have one tool set for all of our applications, whether they're legacy or whether they're shiny new technologies. Um, and I'm pleased to say that this is an open source product. So if it's something which sounds interesting to you, please do check it out and let us know what you think. Um, this diagram shows a high level view of our services. Um, so now the sort of EC2 server stuff is sorted, we're really focusing on on Amazon's amazing data stack. So we're making Kinesis and Dynamo a much more central part of our data architecture. And the goal here is to deliver more personalized and contextual services to our customers. And a great example, something we've released recently, is called BusyBot. It's basically like ways for trains. So we can crowdsource 22,000 inputs from our customers and help them find uh, seats on busy trains. And this is a great example because we built it from idea to production in less than three months. It uses all the cool new serverless technology from Amazon. Um, and it just helped, it shows how we're using Amazon to help us innovate faster for our customers. So 18 months later on, we are all in on AWS. All our dev, test, and production environments are in Amazon. We have converted our monolith to 250 microservices. We've got a 70% reduction in drag. 150 production releases a week, and we have 60% less downtime as well. And the cherry on the cake is that we've actually managed to save $1.5 million a year in our annual hosting costs as well. Now, before I hand back to Werner, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to the Trainline technology teams who made this possible with their hard work and skill. It really was an amazing team effort to get this done so quickly. So thanks very much to them, and thanks to you as well. I enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Very, very cool story to see how they have transformed themselves. Um, an interesting stat was that in the first three months when they had moved to continuous integration, they did 10,000 deployments. Uh, it's amazing that you, um, that you now can actually have this sort of very agile approach at very high scale if you're able to use automation there. I want to pick up something else that, uh, that Chris talked about, so the importance of data. Uh, I think one of the things that cloud has done is completely democratized access to IT resources. Now, it's no longer the case that because you were able to spend a lot of money on your uh, data warehouse, you actually uh, get a competitive advantage because of that. Everybody can have a data warehouse today. Everybody has access to exactly the same level of processing power, to exactly the same level of, uh, of storage engines. There is no difference anymore whether you're a small company or whether you are the richest multinational in the world. You all have access to identical services. So what makes companies then competitive? Now, what is then the major competition that you go after? On one hand, there may be certain business logic. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a company I met last night 
from uh, New Zealand, Xero, is a company that is actually uh, that is all in on trade AWS, but that does uh, accounting software for small and medium businesses. Well, the complexities that they explain to me uh, that need to go into the software are huge. So sometimes it is really knowledge about very specific vertical uh, applications. But mostly, I think, what is going to be the major differentiator among companies is that of data. It is the quality of the data that you have that will be the differentiator between companies. Yeah? And also the way that you're able to ask questions against that data. That's all going to be the differentiator between companies. Yeah? Because you will all have access to the same compute resources. You will all have access maybe to the same software or the same services that you've bought from third parties on this. So it all comes down to who has access to the absolute best data and how can you manage the quality of that data and how can you manage the quality of the analytics on top of that because you all have access to the same analytic services. Yeah, and so AWS helps you there because we absolutely, as Andy already showed you yesterday, have an amazing broad set of analytics capabilities for you. And no matter whether you just want to do low-level data processing, whether you want to do data warehousing, whether you want to do predictive analytics, it's all available to you for everyone to use. And let's look at a few of those, because I think in those, uh, uh, we've made some great strides, even not only with the newer services, but also with existing services. Yeah, so for data processing, I think the, the default tools for everybody to use is uh, Elastic MapReduce. EMR has made great strides this year. And one thing that I'm really proud of with this team is how they've been really on the ball to make sure that you have the absolute latest open source, production ready open source software available to you through EMR. These guys are really on the ball with 5.2. That actually was released last month now. Um, and really have the absolute latest production software ready for you. And whether that is Hive or whether it's Pig or, or Presto or any of those, yeah, all of them for you available to be executed throughout EMR. Yesterday, an amazing announcement by Andy about Amazon Athena. Yeah, allows you now to do analytics directly on data that you've stored in S3. Yeah, we keep a warm pool of uh, compute capacity in multiple availability zones ready for you. Your queries come in, it goes through Presto front end and distributes the queries and gives you answers back in milliseconds. There's a very important thing, and one thing that I'm really, really proud of that the Avina team has done is that it does not force you to store your data in a particular format. You can just store your data and then run your queries over it. There's no pre requested it for you to actually do transformations on that data before Athena can even process it for you. You just store your data. And you run Athena um, to actually query the data that just sits there. It's really amazing. Right? You get your, your, your questions, your answers back in a matter of seconds. It really changes the whole analytics games. Data warehousing. Of course, we have the magnificent Amazon Redshift. And I think one of the things that, that the Redshift team does really well is having such a close relationship with their customers that they're probably one of the services that iterates fastest in terms of delivering new features and functionality. But also in throughput, they've made major strides. This year, a 2x throughput improvement and a 10x faster garbage collection inside uh, Redshift. Amazing. Sometimes, you know, if you want to use data warehousing, you may not have all the technical capabilities to actually make use of Redshift, and you want to go to a much higher level and get support for your analytics. Really discovering your data sources, discovering the data models in there, gives you suggestions around what kind of analytics you should or could run, and also what kind of visualizations you, you, you can run. And Amazon QuickSight is, is one of those tools that is just feels natural if you want to do analytics. If you've never fired up QuickSight, I just urge you to do it. Yeah, especially because it's so visually appealing. And the moment from going to identifying your data sources to actually getting graphs, it's just blindingly fast. Yeah, and this whole engine that sits inside that, the memory-based calculation engine, is, is really, really a piece of beautiful te technology that executes these queries for you really fast. 
Elasticsearch is a service that many of you use. On one hand, of course, for doing sort of search and analytics over your, uh, over your data sets. But what many of, uh, many of our customers are using our, uh, the Elasticsearch service for is actually visualize data that is often coming in full log files. And whether you use the Kibana tools, and this one is actually Logstash, our customers, you are really able to build uh, very extensive dashboarding in real time over the data that you see. Yesterday also, great announcement you know, to get deeper insight into your data. And we had already, of course, been doing machine learning for some, some time. Yeah, we gave you a machine learning service that allows you to take sort of data from the past and make predictions about the future. Yeah, for example, you may have sent emails out to a number of customers with, with some marketing information. You know which of them has responded to, to that. If you have this, those data sets from the past, you can basically make use, find sort of attributes that these customers had in common to predict whether certain customers will respond to future marketing emails for, from you. And the Amazon Machine Learning Service is really something that can help you there. Although, taking, looking at that particular problem, uh, one new way, of course, of engaging customers, uh, especially if they're mobile, is for push notifications. Yeah, and I know we've all push notifications enabled on our phones. And to really be, really drive engagement for customers uh, with through push notifications, you need to be really careful about who you're targeting and when you target it, so that you can really optimize engagement. So we will launch, actually, today a new analytics service for you, uh, which is Amazon Pinpoint, that helps you um, sort of analyze your, uh, your mobile customers, you understand their behavior, define, let's see, how you want to engage them, and then push notifications out to them, and actually track the results of, of, of that. So really an extension of our way in which we help you build mobile applications and making sure that you can target your customers in the, uh, in the most appropriate, but those most effective way to drive more engagement. So with all of that, we have to probably, what I would like to call the broadest set of analytics capabilities available to, to you. Analytics is in the hands of all of you. And it really allows you to, uh, to transform your business, to really drive user analytics, to drive transformations, to really be able to get detailed information about how your business is operating, how your customers can be targeted, and, and how you operate. And we see that this, this is driving really transformation in, in even the largest organizations. And probably here in the US, there is no larger organization than that of the federal government. Yeah, and the federal government has been on a program to really use data to transform how the federal government is operating. And I'm really happy uh, that DJ Patel, the chief data scientist of the federal government, is here to talk to you about how they are using data to transform government. DJ. Good morning. Good morning. You know, we really live in a remarkable time. All of us are sitting around and seeing all this incredible technology that Werner talked about. We often don't take a sense to take a look back at how much has changed and how much really incredible innovation has happened. If you just think of 10 years ago, what did the world really look like when our phones didn't take pictures? Buying shoes on the internet was a weird idea. You know, carrying maps, stacks around was a normal thing. Today, it's not what we can do. It's what do we expect from our technology. We expect from our technology a world in which, you know, that everything is there of instant news to car services on demand, real time, traffic, the whole thing of everything seamlessly working, all that integrated into a server experience where you can even have one day shipping. So when you think about that at the national level, at the White House, the president really has been focused on how do we make sure that's true across the nation. We really empower the next generation of innovation to take place. And so with that, he created the office of the US Chief Data Scientist, and he gave us a mission. That mission is to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. 
There's two parts of this statement and this mission that are the most important. The first is responsibly. Because just because we can doesn't always mean we should. We have to think about how do we do this? What is the manner in which we do it? And all the other aspects that go along with doing anything with technology in a responsible manner. The second is for all Americans. And what do we mean when we say all Americans? I would assert to you the way all of us should think of it as technologists as that a technology is neither radical nor revolutionary unless it benefits every single person. Every single person. So I'll give you an example of how we've been thinking about that across all the programs in the United States. Let me introduce you to Pete and Kevin Early. This is what a happy father-son relationship should look like, but it hasn't always been that case because Kevin has schizophrenia. One time, broke into a neighbor's house, put himself in the bathroom, naked. Psychotic episodes. If you think that this isn't just happening to a family like Pete and Kevin, it's going to happen to one of you or someone that you know or a loved one. Those are just the numbers. What's interesting about this situation in this case is what did the police do when they got called because of the burglary? the attempt of the idea that someone is breaking in. Do they approach in, do they come in guns drawn? Because these are officers whose lives are on the lines every day. This case, the officers were trained in crisis intervention. They recognized the symptoms of mental illness, and they were able to take the appropriate response and get him to the care that they can't, needed. They didn't put him in jail. Why is this so important? Because in this year alone, 11.4 million people will go through our 3,100 jails. Just look at those numbers, look at those ratios, and you will see that's crazy. 95% will not go to prison. They will stay there an average of 23 days. We are cycling them. So the White House created what's called the Data Driven Justice Initiative. This now covers over 94 million Americans and simply says, how do we take the data from the criminal justice system, meld it with the healthcare ecosystem to identify interventions so that mental health People with mental health issues get to the right care. Opioid issues get to the right care. It's data science that powers for everybody. Cities that do this get amazing lift in not only benefits of savings, but they're able to close jails at scale. But it's not just that, because we have to think about the revolution that's for every one of them. Because where's the tech revolution for them? We have to make that possible and scale for everyone. Next, I want to introduce you to Jennifer Bittner. Jennifer wrote in to the President's Precision Medicine Initiative team, which is the idea of, well, if you get tailored glasses, why don't you get tailored healthcare treatment at the genomic level? And she has a beautiful son. It's her husband, Rod. She wrote in singularly because she said, we have to go faster on medical research. Because Jennifer, under the type of cancer that she has, she will not see her son grow up. But we can make this happen. Why? Because in cancer, the answer isn't in a database. The sad reality is it's in thousands of databases. It's fragmented. And the answer likely is already out there. We just don't know how to put it together. And the fact that something as simple as ETL extract transform load is getting in the way of watching Jennifer watch her kid grow up is ridiculous. All of you in this audience have the powerful to change that destiny, not just for her, but for every single person. We have to accept that we live in a world where we have to take the responsibility that technology has to work for us, not against us. You all have that power. So our time as an administration is coming to an end. Where We're getting ready to hand off to a new team. And so what are the three core things that I would like to make sure that you all know from our time in championing this. The first is that people are always greater than the data. I haven't shown you any equations. I haven't shown you any graphs. I've just shown you the people that impact things. We're all used to as technologists and building great ideas and things, and we say there's edge cases. I want you to remember those edge cases have a name. Their name's Pete. Their name's Jennifer. There's Giselle. There's Sam, there's Jerome. Every one of them has a name. Remember that. It's the people that matter. Second, in every single project, whether it's the idea of ending cancer through the Vice President's Cancer Moonshot, whether it's trying to understand the changing dynamics 
of how the brain works through the Brain Initiative, providing health care for all Americans through the Affordable Care Act, or finding the next generation of tailored treatments through presidential initiatives like the Precision Medicine Initiative. Data is a force multiplier in every single dimension of our society, whether it's federal, local, or state. And then the final thing I want to tell you, there's always a question of when do you jump in? The time is now. Why is the time is now? Because these problems can't wait. There are $20 billion getting sucked out of local schools to, and your local city going to this jail issue. You can help transform that. You don't have to do it at the federal level. You can do it at the city level. You can do it local. You can do it at the nonprofits. The time now is to serve. And when you jump into a problem, whether it's part-time, full-time, or any of that, you will change the world, not just for all of us here, not for the nation today, but for your kids, my kids, and our kids' kids. Thank you. It's very humbling that we're able to help the federal government with programs like this. And let's see, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do at AWS to actually provide you tools to, for example, make connecting those thousands of databases together much easier. No longer that that is something that is impossible, but that's something that actually is becoming easier. 80% of what we call analytics is not analytics at all. It's just hard work. It's just heavy lifting. It's not executing your query through Athena or through your data warehouse. It is a lot of hard work that has nothing to do with analytics at all. Yeah, this is sometimes what we call analytics. Yeah? How to get the data in, how to run the indices, how to make sure the right access is given, all of that kind of things are actually what we call analytics, but it's not analytics at all. It never executes a query. It never gets a result. And it's 80% of the work that you do if you work in analytics. So let's take a look at what are actually the components of what I would call a modern data architecture that should have all of these, that, that what are the pieces that sit in there that we should solve such that it's no longer 80% of the work that goes into f of analytics, that goes into things that are not at all analytics. Yeah? The first thing to remember is that data environments are changing dramatically. They're all becoming agile as well. You get different sets of customers. Now, with the launch, for example, of Redshift, we suddenly see individual business units running their data warehouse. It's no longer a centralized resource. The users are changing the whole time. You get different queries. You get different types of sources. You get multiple sources coming together, not only from inside your company, but often from outside your company as well. Different types of queries, new applications, all are becoming data-driven, and, and very different processing re requirements. So, so what are the components of a modern data architecture? Yeah? It starts off with having reliable and automatic data ingestion. How do you get data? into a place where you can actually access it for analytics. Step two, the ability to preserve original source data. Now, often people call this a data lake. I'm shying a bit away from it because many companies have claimed the word data lake also as a, uh, as a, uh, let's say as a product name. But really, this is a place where you can store all original data, not just sort of the end state of a transaction, but sort of all the states that you went through, so it's ready for analytics, have a place where you can preserve the original source data. Then how do you do life cycle management? Now, sometimes data is, the data is getting old, and you may want to move it to a place where you can access it later, but not immediately. They have to capture the metadata. Yeah? And so there's three different types of metadata. Technical, sort of what's the, what's the type of the data that is actually I'm capturing? And then operational. How do these, you know, what time, from which data source did this data come? And then there's metadata, sort of, what is the business context of this particular data? Yeah? Where did it come from? How did it operate? Then you have to manage government, governance, security, privacy. 
Now you have to figure out exactly what is the provenance and the lineage of this data that is coming in. Right? What are the auditing controls that you put in place? Security, privacy considerations, compliance. Right? And an important tool there for you is to do data classification. These are the classifications we use at Amazon. Yeah? We have five different classifications. Critical, restricted, highly confidential, confidential, and public. Our customer data all lives in critical. That's our critical data. That nobody can actually basically access that data. Yeah? Only on the very strict controls can either applications or individuals access that particular data. You all have to go through these data classifications, things that everybody has to do. Then you have to be able to find the data. And preferable no longer having to go for a DBA or for a centralized data warehouse to get access to it. Be able to do self-service discovery, search, access, have APIs for it. And then an important step for quite a few has always been to manage data quality. Yeah, remember, garbage in is garbage out. Yeah? And as such, you do need to do something around your data often to actually, for example, do deduping. Yeah, or get, uh, get faulty records out. Not too often, though. Remember that if you really want to preserve the original source data, you might make the, open, the, the original data immutable and do this management of data quality sort of on new data sets. You then need to prepare this for analytics, because quite a few of your analytics engines are not like Athena. They actually require very specific input formats, uh, the, the ETL that DJ talked about. And then you have to orchestrate and do job scheduling around this. And you have to have mechanisms that will capture data change, meaning that if changes happen at the source, you can actually execute um, new analytics driven by, by that. By the way, the reality of all of this is that the real world doesn't live in a data lake. Yeah? Your data sources are going to be sitting in many different silos throughout your organization for quite some time to come. So I think even though a modern data architecture may all be centered around this sort of original source data as a data lake, the reality is that's not the case, not for a long time to come. So any solution needs to be able to treat your data as that they live in silos. But you still need this data architecture to make sure that you can get access to that particular data. So let's take a look at how this data architecture will look like on AWS. Actually, all the tools that we already have in place for you there. Yeah? It starts off with automated ingestion. We have S3 upload, we have S3 acceleration uh, for you. If you have larger files, you can make use of the edge locations to actually drive data into S3. Kinesis of time, of course, for, for real time. Yeah? We can now drive a truck up to your data center if, that's what you're, uh, if you have that much data that you need to hurdle it over the highway back to our data centers. And quite a few of you are actually making use, for example, of Dynamo streams to actually get original source data streams of updates that are happening in DynamoDB. So that's part number one. Pres preservation of original source data sits probably in many different places on AWS. Yeah? S3 is an ideal place to build your data lake. Yeah, but quite often your data will be sitting in EFS and it will also be sitting in EBS or it will be living in relational databases. All of them are solutions that we have for you on AWS, of course. <coughs> Actually, the S3 team is really on fire. Now, what I've seen, you may think that this is a 10-year-old service or 12-year-old by now, so it's sort of the original service, yeah? These guys are kind of boring, it's just storage, yeah? No, these guys are really, truly on fire. If you've seen what they've delivered in the past year, yeah, it's amazing. And now at reInvent, there's five new pieces. Already the, earlier in the week, they had uh, CloudTrail events, such that each access to each object in S3, you can find back in, in uh, CloudTrail. Uh, they'll support S3 object tagging now, which means that you can write, for example, IAM policies based on tagging, saying all of these objects with these particular tags should have this particular IAM strategy uh, applied to them. We'll give you S3 analytics, right, which gives you deep insight in which objects are accessed most frequently or which objects are not accessed at all. So you get a whole analytics environment there that is driven so you can sort of define different storage classes. Which objects should you actually move to, uh, 
into Glacier. CloudWatch metrics gives you deep insight, for example, into how your objects are being used. It gives you uh, sort of throughput, for example, how often uh, objects are accessed, but also, for example, latency to first byte is something that, uh, that this will give you. And you can get, now get something that's called S3 inventory, which is uh, periodically you can get yourself a, a, a CSV file with information about all the objects based on a particular prefix. It's great work that this team has done. Uh, Lifecycle management combines sort of the functionality that you have in S3 for automatic identifying objects and if like a lifecycle policy is to put things into Glacier. Yeah, governments, we have CloudTrail for you. We have Convic to actually manage exactly who can access which, which particular uh, uh, prefixes. And KMS to help you encrypt the data on there. It's not completely everything that I would expect in this modern data architecture, but we'll get to that in a minute. Managing data quality is a very important one. And I love the fact that EMR is actually a sad elephant. Yeah? Oh, by the way, if I would have to manage data quality, I would be a sad elephant as well. But, uh, so managing data quality, EMR is the tool that you use to actually do sort of transformations, to find duplicates and things like that. It's the tool to use if you want to do right, large data processing. We're missing a few pieces, though. Yeah, so it's really important to really fill out all of these pieces if we want to make sure that we can take this 80% of hard work away from you. We need some more glue. We need to glue these different pieces together. With that, I'm really, really happy to announce AWS Glue. <laughs> <coughs> Which really, really takes care of all the open pieces that we still had there for you to really execute a modern data architecture on, on AWS. It's a fully managed data catalog, an ETL service, an execution service. Let's take a look at what sits in there. First step that you can do with Glue is to build your data catalog. Right? So you are able to point to different data sources. It might be S3, it might be DynamoDB, it might be, uh, um, it might be your RDS instances, and most importantly, any JDBC database. That means that you can also connect this to databases that you're still running on-premise. This is not something that is cloud only. Yeah? It can connect to databases in the cloud as well as on-premise. So the crawlers then will go through those databases, retrieve the metadata, build the data, ca data ca catalog for you. You can set your access control and mechanisms who is allowed to access which particular data if you have all that metadata available. The second part of Glue is to be able to build these transformations, to prepare the data for analytics, yeah, where you can take the data in any of these databases and then prepare them into a format that your particular analytics engine wants to see. And the third piece of functionality in Glue is the ability to schedule and run those jobs and to make sure that if data changes at the origin, these jobs are triggered again to make sure that you always have access to the latest information. So we step back to look at sort of what were the pieces missing in this modern data architecture? What were the pieces there that we had for you? And I think with AWS Glue, uh, we are actually covering all of them. With AWS Glue and all the other AWS services that you have available to you, you're now able to build a comprehensive data architecture on AWS. Yeah. So it's amazing the kind of services that we have available for you for this. Yeah, and I think really that it's up to you. Remember that I said earlier that we give you primitives. We give you the choice how you really want to do your analytics in this case. And we'll make sure that we can do all of this on AWS. You never have to go outside. Uh, we have every possible analytics engine available for you. Very strong support for doing exploration, finding new data sources, you know, combining data sources together. Security and governance are, again, first citizens in the data architecture. And then we remove all the heavy lifting. I believe with all of the new tools that we have at AWS, we are really flipping this around for you. Yeah? 
80% of the work that you're going to do will be analytics, will be true analytics, and only 20% will be work. Many of our customers have been using data all over the place and doing amazing things with it, really transforming their world, and even building platforms such that in ways that has never done before, and in ways that, again, their customers can build applications in ways nobody's done before. And there's one company that I think is one of the coolest in terms of data analytics that's been willing to come and talk to you on stage. These guys are all in on AWS. I'd like to invite Eric Gunderson, the CEO of Mapbox, to talk to you about how they're using analytics and visualization on AWS. Hey, thank you, Werner. Thank you, Werner. As everybody here knows, maps and location are now just part of everything. And at Mapbox, we're building the platform for developers to own this experience, to design maps and put location into the applications that you're building. Our tools let you customize everything, from the style, look, and feel of the map, to controlling the underlying data. I mean, we even have auto companies starting to load in high-precision GPS data to start mapping what roads are safe for semi-autonomous driving. And all of this is happening in AWS. Our maps change how you explore a city, like with National Geographic, and understand what's going on in the market, and make business decisions in Tableau. And when you're on the other side of the world, help you find a cool place to stay. And no matter where you are in the world, be able to track breaking news. We built all of this using video game technology that lets us out, we can render the map at 60 frames a second. This doesn't just make our maps faster and smoother on mobile. You can visualize streams of live data, like monitoring forest fires from outer space using the satellites just launched by Digital Globe that can see through smoke. With AWS, this is fully global and redundant for us. Last month, 55,000 developers were using Mapbox inside their application. And those applications were touched by more than a quarter billion people. Today, this is all happening across 10 AWS regions. In each region, we're in at least two different availability zones. And then in the background, we're using S3 to transfer petabytes of map data and satellite imagery in between continents and keep everything in sync. This doesn't just give us redundancy. This gives us speed. So when Europe wakes up in the morning, opens the Financial Times, checks the market, a couple hours later, commute's starting in New York and everybody's looking for a cup of coffee, and then you're getting your lunch delivered in San Francisco with DoorDash, it doesn't matter where you are. Our maps are always fast, because Route 53 is directing you to the closest CloudFront CDN endpoint. It's so much more than just maps, So, At Mapbox, we want to change how you move around a city. ETAs, turn-by-turn -turn directions, this is the stuff that gets you to work on time. And this data changes every single minute. Can I turn here? Is this a one way? How many lanes are there? What's the speed limit? We want to map and measure everything. Yesterday alone, we collected 100 million miles of anonymized sensor data from our Maps SDK. But it's not about the data. It's about how fast we turn that data into a product that helps route you around traffic and analyze the road network. Most importantly, this data is totally anonymized and aggregated. So we encrypt everything in KMS, and then move it through Kinesis. The encrypted data then hits EC2s that process, aggregate it, analyze it, and snap it to the road network. 
as you can imagine, the infrastructure we need to start processing data at this scale is constantly changing. By the end of the day, we're going to have another 100 million miles. And tomorrow, we're going to have another 100 million miles. By January, we're going to have collected and processed 10 billion miles of data. So I want to show you what that infrastructure looks like. Last year alone, the amount of EC2 compute hours that we used increased 1,044%. But our COGS actually decreased. By moving everything over to the spot market and being able to buy unused EC2 instances, we weren't just able to scale up and process all this data faster. We're now doing it at one-tenth of the cost. And now we're farther optimizing our COGS, loading our platform into Docker containers. So now I don't even care what instances are available on the spot market. We can just load whatever is cheapest up with Docker containers and run it. Look, for us, costs matter at every point of this. We started building on AWS in 2007. We were fully bootstrapped. We didn't take a dime of outside funding until three years ago when we needed to scale globally. Today, we're 200 strong. And last week, we reported to the board that once again, we improved our mar margins because of AWS cost optimizations. But honestly, the greatest savings we've had is focus. Look at everything we didn't have to build to support our infrastructure, allowing us to stay heads down building product. And that focus is what's allowed us to expand so fast. So now we're expanding everywhere. Today, at AWS reInvent, we're announcing the opening of Mapbox.cn, our operations in China. This means you can now access the exact same API that you've been accessing globally in country, all built on AWS Beijing. Now, whether you're on Wi-Fi or whether you're Roman internationally, our maps are 10 times faster. As we look to 2017, we're going to continue to scale, both on AWS and with you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Also amazing that the kind of things that we do worldwide can actually help them launch a business in a location that they would never have been able to do this by themselves. If you actually look at the kind of data processing that, uh, that Mapbox did, it is a, um, it's a challenge that quite a few of our customers have. These really very large data sets that need to go through pipelines where you need significant processing for. Yeah? And whether you're in financial services or life sciences or digital media, there's still a need for significantly large processing on top of the AWS platform. And we actually see that quite a few of our customers are, uh, are sort of struggling with that because there's a lot of heavy lifting around this very large-scale processing. Yeah, you need to, uh, especially in the older days, you had only had provisioned very fixed clusters. Uh, you need to run batch software. You need to manage your priorities. You need to deal with failed, failed instances and, and stuff like that or failed, failed components. All of that is very hard to do. There's a lot of heavy lifting around this very large-scale data processing that you have. And especially if you then also want to make use of, co of uh, things such as the spot market, you know, it becomes pretty complex. And as always, as I said earlier on, we're really in the business of pain management here. And this is a significant pain for customers that have very large-scale data processing. So for that, we'll give you a new service. Yeah? It's called Amazon Batch, AWS Batch, that is a fully managed batch processing at any scale, um, which helps you do this very large-scale processing. Yeah? It is a fully compliant batch processing software that you do not need to install anywhere on your, on your servers. It will dynamically provision uh, compute resources and optimize sort of this job distribution over the different resources. You can make use of spot market in an automatic fashion. You can have sort of matching of certain jobs with particular type of resources, for example, a memory intensive instance or a compute intensive instance or one that goes on the spot market. You can have 
priorities in your jobs, uh, all of these things are for things that we will enable for you. You no longer have to worry about those pain points that you have in very large scale data processing that you want to process in a batch fashion. Processing, of course, has always been something that has been close to our heart. Yeah, and so let's take a look how compute has been transformed by the capabilities that we've given you over the years. And if you look at sort of, there's always three different areas, I think, these days, where everybody's sort of trying to figure out exactly how all of these components fit together and how you should think about them. Now, when I think about virtual machines versus containers versus serverless, I sort of divide them up in sort of usage patterns. Yeah, and so I look at them, there's differentiation between them in packaging, the way that you manage and update them, what kind of execution runs inside of those components, and basically, how do you pay for them? Now, if you look at VMs, the execution model is that of AMIs. It is the output of a configuration process. Yeah? And then you'll update your software that runs in there. You do it through patching. Yeah? The execution engine inside a VM is that of sort of multiple tasks and multiple threads that are executing in parallel with each other. Yeah? For example, if you have a, a service that deals with sort of customer information, it might both serve logins, it might serve updates to passwords, it might serve their address book, all of those set in one component. If you think about containers, the execution model of containers is that of a container file. A container file is no longer something you configure, it's the output of your development process. Yeah? And so this container file is immutable. Yeah? You update it for versioning. And the containers have one single task. Yeah? It just does password updates or it just manages your address book, or it only does logins. One single task. Each task can have multiple threads, so it can handle multiple connections in parallel, but still, you have only one task per container. Yeah? Your runtime is often that of minutes to months, minutes to months, basically. If you look at VMs, they're months to years. I have a few VM instances that are running two or three years. Yeah? And the unit cost in both cases is still per VM that you're running, because containers still map down to virtual machines underneath that. Lambda, the core of our serverless approach, is radically different. Yeah? The output there is that of a function, is code that you put into your Lambda environment. Again, that is immutable. You update it through versioning. And each Lambda function is indeed one single task, but also one single thread. We take care of the parallel execution. If you need to run 10,000 of them in parallel, we'll take care of that for you. But it's one thread, one task per lambda function. We run microseconds to seconds, and the unit cost is radically different. Yeah, it's the amount of memory that you hold per second, as well as the number of requests that we're executing. And Lambda comes with a significant free tier. Why? Because we're using Lambda all over the place that you can use, and we feel that you should not be paying for that. It's not just the VMs. Compute is not just the compute units. Yeah, although virtual machines are really important, and you saw yesterday in Andy's keynote an amazing set of new instance types that you can be using, the power of all of this, in my eyes, really comes from the supporting cost. Yeah? ELB, the ability to have both classic load balancers as well as application load balancers driving traffic to you, securing your execution environment through VPC, using auto-scaling, using RDS, using EBS, using EFS, that whole collection of tools is what makes this VM system so, so powerful in your hands. If you look at containers, yeah, it's really sort of the move towards more microservices, more control over the way that you scale and execute your software is really driving the use of containers. However, you know, container management and container execution, 
for quite a few of our customers, especially if you use some of the open source software, is really a pain. You really almost go outside of the cloud world again. You have to manage your own execution. You have to manage your task placements. You have to do all of these things that you're actually used to in cloud that we would do for you. Actually, I'm moving away again. You have to manage the reliability yourself. If you have to run Zookeeper or ETCD to actually manage the reliability of your systems, that's a pain. Yeah. And I think Amazon ECS, the, Amazon EC, the Elastic Compute, uh, Elastic Container Service, the EC2 Container Service, really is the tool you want to use for all of this. Because there we bring back the power of cloud for your container management system. You no longer have to worry about how to manage your clusters. You no longer have to worry about exacting, orchestrating how to place your containers over the different pieces uh, of execution in the different AZs that you have. And very importantly, this comes with very deep AWS integration. One of the things that I've seen happening with some of our customers that are taking, for example, some of the open source container software is that they suddenly have to give up on security. Yeah, because they no longer can set, for example, IAM rules on their execution environment. It has to go through all of the VM instances that run underneath them. Deep integration with AWS means that we're giving, bringing back the power of cloud and giving it into your hands so that you can set IAM rules per container. You don't have to give up on security if you want to move to containers. Yeah, it's really important in my eyes. You can set, for example, minimum access rules. For example, this container is only allowed to access these pieces of DynamoDB. That one is only allowed to have S3. Now, it's really important if you want to protect your customers to be able to continue to have all the power of cloud in your hands when you're developing for containers. Now, we give you lots of other things that the deep integration into CloudWatch events, for example, and CloudWatch logs, such that you can get all the logs of particular containers together in one particular place. And X-Ray, which, uh, which we saw earlier on, the deep inspection engine for all of your execution works really well with containers as well, so you can actually really trace the execution of individual containers. Um, soon, we will give you a new task placement engine that where you have more control over exactly what kind of strategies you want to use. Yeah, you might want to pick certain availability zones or instance types, or you want to only run these particular tasks on this particular instance type because, uh, for example, they have a GPU attached to it. And you can all sorts of custom placement strategies have it. Yeah, the task placement engine will support bin packing, will support spreading. That means sort of really spreading it out over AZs or over different instances. You can have affinities. These two tasks should run together on a particular uh, uh, instant, uh, cluster instance. Yeah, or you can have spreading them out over very unique instances. These should only run on an instance that have a GPU attached to them. Core with that is an event stream, yeah? so that all the changes that are happening in the container instance environment, as well as at the task placement environment, we service events to you. That means that you can build tools um, that both consume those events, and you can do visualization on them, but also you can build your own schedulers. You could be able, should be able to build your own schedulers there. And actually, that's something that we've heard from our customers. They really want to have more control over their schedulers. Yeah, you either want to have build your own schedulers for very unique applications, or you want to be able to sort of impact third party, integrate third party uh, schedulers, such as Mesos and things like that. And you want to be able to test locally. Now we've been thinking about this because we have this deep relationship here with, our, with the community around it. How to best engage you on that? Because we're not so arrogant that we think we should be doing this for you. We should be doing this with you. And as such, we've decided to engage with the community on this for an open source project or for an open source environment. So I'm happy to announce today, to introduce to you Blocks, which is a collection of open source projects for building container management and orchestration services for ECS. Yeah, Blocks. <coughs> blocks will be a collection of open source projects where we will work together with you. It starts off with two components. Yeah, one is a cluster state service, which basically consumes the event streams that are coming from ECS and persists those locally, and then you can make queries against it. 
And we'll launch one reference scheduler, a daemon scheduler, that's basically capable of sort of launching daemons at each of the, uh, each of the uh, container instances that you have, for example, a matrix uh, daemon or uh, something else that, we, that you want to run at each of the instances. Yeah, so those two open source projects and many more to come um, will service for you through GitHub. Uh, check out uh, this, uh, this URL. All the components will be released on the Apache 2.0, and we have a, a channel on uh, uh, a Gitter channel for you to engage with the team that is actually sort of maintaining and managing these open source projects with you. It's interesting to see how these containers actually are really driving, uh, driving changes in the way that systems are being built. And that even some of our oldest customers that have built amazing systems on top of AWS are, uh, we are enabling with uh, our container service the way that they're building software. And there's probably no uh, more advanced customer on our platform than Netflix. And Netflix is also going through a number of transformations in a way that they're building their systems. I'm very happy to uh, invite Neil Hunt on stage, the chief product officer of, uh, of Netflix, to talk to you about their changes in their development. Well, good morning, and thank you. And thank you, Werner, for inviting me on the stage here. Um, my name is Neil Hunt. I'm the Chief Product Officer of Netflix. And uh, I have a fabulous team working on uh, cloud and containers. And many of you are out here in the audience today, so thank you. I'm going to talk about some of the work to do. First, a uh, little background. Um, we're about uh, 86 million customers in 190 countries. Um, delivering about 150 million hours of streaming video every day. Um, more important for this audience, um, we run everything out of AWS. We're in three regions, 12 zones, and we have a fleet of about 100,000 uh, instances uh, running at peak times. We started our migration to AWS in about 2008, and it was a fairly long process. Um, the message to let AWS do the heavy lifting of managing the infrastructure resonated loudly and clearly with us. And we completed our migration earlier this year and unplugged our last data center. All done, finished. We don't have a data center anymore, and that's great. And we've achieved improved productivity, scalability. We've got a much more nimble architecture. And more important, AWS pushes the state of the art in new features. And every year, we get to take advantage and adopt new stuff. And this year is no different. So we've structured our systems as about 500 microservices um, by decoupling the modules so that each team can push independently. We achieve a continuous deployment that gives us agility, gives us the ability to iterate faster. And we've built a large set of tools, which many of you already use. A lot of them are open source. Things like Spinnaker for continu continuous integration and deployment. Uh, things like Atlas and Edda, to, Edda for monitoring and for history. And things like the Simeon Army, uh, the Chaos Monkey, for testing reliability. And those kinds of tools are really important to the productivity that we achieve. So over the past year, We've seen the opportunity to embrace containers to further optimize our microservices architecture. It's a great fit. The goal is to enhance developer productivity by bridging the gap between the desktop and the production environment, and to give us a finer granularity of isolation critical for running the lightweight runtime, such as Node.js and Python. To adopt containers into our what will be a hybrid environment we built Titus. Uh, Titus is our container runtime environment for both batch and service-facing applications. And we also built Fenzo. It's an open source, pluggable library to address some of those advanced scheduling needs. We wanted to be able to deal with the kinds of scheduling stuff that Werner was just talking about. But we really don't want or need to operate all of this infrastructure. We firmly believe that it's best to let AWS do that heavy lifting of managing the infrastructure. 
And so this year, we've turned our attention uh, to working with AWS on the features we need to be able to hand off more of that container execution environment in, in the way that you've just seen. And that's where Blocks comes in. Blocks is aimed exactly at this, this uh, space that we're heading to. And we're excited to engage with the Blocks open source effort to integrate those Titus features uh, into Blocks and ECS to get the features that we need so that we can do that handoff. So our long-term goal, then, is to let AWS do all the infrastructure work, especially where it isn't Netflix-specific. Um, our development team can really focus on adding the features that are unique to Netflix so that we can deliver the most compelling service to our members. So thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Neil. Um, also, thanks to Netflix in general for over the years. Um, they've been great contributors to the community. They've created um, quite a lot of open source. Remember that we all started off with these monkeys that were able to shoot uh, different instances. Yeah, a whole army, symbiont armies at one moment that you could do to test your environment. We're really in debt to Netflix and to the Netflix team for all the software that they've built over time and released to you in general. So now we've had containers, we have VMs. Let's take a look at, uh, at serverless. And of course, serverless is associated with Lambda, the ability for you to execute functions on, on AWS. And let's take a look at the, the state of AWS Lambda. Yeah, so the different languages that we have available for you, Java, JavaScript, Python. Um, and the integration with all the other services that can trigger sort of Lambda functions. Most importantly in that, of course, being the API gateway. That really allows you to build uh, systems for the API gateway that will trigger Lambda functions. We had quite a few uh, features released in 2016. These are sort of, from what we expect for me, sort of the highlights uh, of it. Binary uh, API support, binary support for uh, the API gateway, uh, the ability to actually access services that live in your VPC. And, and most importantly, and it doesn't look that terribly sexy in all of this, is in my eyes environment variables. Let's go back all the way to the beginning of my uh, presentation when I think I talked to you about the 12-factor app. Yeah? The way that you use environment variables is to specialize the execution that you're running. Yeah? And for example, environment, environment variables could be used for whether you're running a staging, or whether you're running a pre-production, or whether you're running an A-B testing. And we allow you to, to these uh, environment variables are key value store, key value um, attributes, and you store them in KMS. That means that you can encrypt them. Yeah, so nobody has access to this particular configuration information. Nobody can change it. Only those who have specific access, you encrypt them, and your, your uh, Lambda functions can decrypt them and then specialize their behavior. Yeah, it's, doesn't look that terribly important, but it is, in my eyes, a great enabler for really doing modern development. We were, there's a language, actually, that was highly requested for Lambda. So today, we have available for you C Sharp. <laughs> uh, um, I've always loved C, C Sharp. I think almost from day one, it's really truly modern language that you can develop in, and, and apparently, Quite a few are doing this. Um, you know, and I'm really happy that we can add that to the collection of languages that is available for you to write your functions in. Again, I want to come back to something that I mentioned earlier in containers. The fact that you go to functions doesn't mean you give up on security. Yeah, all the security tools that have come with VMs that we have made available for you in containers are also available for you when you build your service application. Yeah? From day one, we've integrated IAM roles into how to execute Lambda functions, in what context they should execute. And the community actually has been uh, really active around this. There have been a number of strategies that, uh, that quite a few people have blogged about, about how exactly to best write IAM roles if you have sort of, on one hand, limit, uh, minimal privilege, but on the other hand, may have something that you need to sort of combine different privileges. Yeah? But still, it gives you powerful primitives to really control the security of your applications. 
And there's this, uh, there's this great joke, of course. Remember the analogy from the earlier days of, of on-premise versus cloud? This was the story of uh, pets versus cattle. Yeah? Your servers were like pets. Yeah? If, they, if they became ill, you had to nurture them back to health. In cloud, your compute units are like cattle. If they become ill, you put them out to pasture and you get yourself a new one. Yeah? In serverless, there is no cattle anymore. It's only the herd. It's only your application. You no longer have to, have to think about nurturing things back to health or getting new ones. All the execution is taken care of by us. And again, serverless is not just Lambda. Serverless is the whole collection of managed services that we give to you that you can make use of. It's not just, not just Lambda. Lambda is just the execution engine. But it's the combination between Lambda, DynamoDB, API Gateway, Kinesis Streams, all of these, combining these things together, is what allows you to build serverless application, not just Lambda. It is the whole ecosystem that AWS gives to you that allows you to do this. And even third-party ecosystem. You want to pull in Stripe for mobile payments? You want to pull in Twilio because you need to send some SMS messages? All of those things are available for you. This is what serverless is. It's the whole collection of services that we manage for you where you no longer have to worry about the execution of it and the reliability and scale. All of that is handled for you. And it's not just that sort of young, modern companies are going down this path with serverless. Many of the largest enterprises have figured out that this is the way that is most cost effective for them to really, at very large scale, do execution. Right? So this afternoon, there was a serverless minicon, and the guys from FINRA who process half a trillion stock trades a day, where each of them is a lambda execution of a lambda function. They'll be talking to you this afternoon about how they're building and using Lambda at scale. We ourselves are using Lambda all over the place, of course, and you must have noticed this already. It's the extension mechanism in AWS. Yeah, for example, if you use, um, if you use config, yeah, if you can, have, you can have Lambda functions executing on particular config rules. Yeah, if you make use of user pools, there are, I think, something like 12 extensibility, pool, uh, extensibility mechanisms of how you extend user pools with your specific actions whenever a customer logs in or when they want to change their password or when they sign up. We use it as an extensibility mechanism all over the place. And like you saw yesterday as well, if you think about Alexa or if you think about Amazon Lex or if you think about green grass on your own IoT devices or if you think about Snowball at the edge, all of them make use of Lambda as their execution environment. There's one particular use case that you've actually asked us about, uh, whether we could introduce compute as well. And that is, if you are building web app applications, yeah, often to do very dynamic content, you always have to go back to the source. You can't go back through. Uh, there's nothing that you can do at the content delivery net network. You really have to go back to the source, which, in which introduces quite a bit of latency. And so you've asked us there whether we can't do anything about the speed of light. Uh, no, not that. But maybe we can sort of cut the path in half before you can do execution. So I'd love to introduce to you today Lambda at the Edge, which allows you to execute Lambda functions at CloudFront. <laughs> These, uh, these functions are able to inspect your HTTP requests and take actions on them. They modify the HTTP requests so you can do processing at the edge locations without having to go back to uh, the original source. But, you know, quite a few actually have been building Lambda applications, application Lambda, that are a bit more complex than just a few, just a few functions. Uh, things like, you know, I actually want to chain these functions. Or I want to run these five in parallel, but based on sort of the data, I want to go left versus right. And so 
there's all these different ways that you would want to coordinate uh, functions. Yeah, you can do them in different ways, of course. Yeah, you can really do function uh, sort of function calls among them. It's not really sort of scalable development in my eyes. You can do chaining, but then it becomes difficult about what do you do with state when you have to chain these things together? How do you manage that? Of course, you can put the, ch the, the state in a DynamoDB database, but then the next problem pops up. How do you coordinate? How do you do retries? How do you make sure that some particular exec uh, uh, function has executed? So reliability becomes an issue, and whether you do that through a database or whether you do it for using queues, all of these give you these particular challenges of coordination. And coordinating these very large-scale Lambda applications is a pain. Yeah? How do you scale that? How do you do error handling? How do you keep the state? All of these things. Yeah? So how do you step through such, a, such an and this execution environment to make sure that everything executes reliably and consistently? And of course, given that we want to take this pain of coordination away, I am excited about one of the coolest releases that we'll do today, that of AWS Step Functions, that allows you to coordinate different components of a Lambda application through a state machine. So you basically, what you can do is you can build your application as a state machine, have the different functions in there. You do this in a visual way. We coordinate the components through multiple steps. We visualize the application also as a set of multiple steps and then allow you to execute the complete state machine based on sort of the inputs or the triggers that you have. We do this in a visual way. So you get this editor where you can actually sort of combine the different uh, Lambda functions together, the different states that you have there. And you can implement quite a few different sort of strategies there that you want to. Do you want to do this as sort of sequential steps? These are the five steps you need to do between the different functions that you need to execute. Um, do things need to happen in parallel? Yeah, you branch things out to other places. Or indeed, based on particular data units, do you want to go left? Do you want to go through the middle? Do you want to go right? Yeah, this really helps you with building sophisticated applications on top of Lambda. We're using a state machine approach there doesn't necessarily cover every possible uh, application pattern, but it's a really, it covers a very large set of them. And I think state machine approach is a really good way to model your applications if you're taking a serverless approach. Yeah? I hope that these things go back to your desktops, go back to your workstations, and really try this out, because this gives you a great set of tools to build very complex of sophisticated applications using Lambda. So the important thing remains in all of this, that each of those are first-class citizens with deep integration on the AWS platform. It is not just about Lambda. It's about security plus Lambda and all the other services. It is important that if you run containers that you don't have to give up on all the other things that you were used to on cloud. They are first-class citizens, each and every one of them. So I hope that after today and yesterday, you walk away with thinking about how you can transform your business. If you look at the kind of things that we've released in the past two days, it's just mind-boggling. Yeah? Those are the things that Andy announced yesterday, things that happened today. I uh, really like F1, is an, is an amazing kind of approach to building hardware acceleration. Uh, I love Athena, because that will really allow you no longer to have to think about data and just execute queries. Um, I'm not allowed to have any favorites, of course, but X-Ray is actually really cool. Shield, yeah, the fact that you now have DDoS protect, protection out of the box for all of you. Yeah? Glue, that really completes our whole data architecture, really combining all the different pieces, and you're no longer having to worry about all the heavy lifting there. And this last piece, of course, step functions is really going to change the way that you will build um, distributed applications. There's one more transformation to go, of course. Any bets? Yeah? 
Let's look at what we did in the past years. I think we had some amazing parties in the past years. Yeah, I mean, started off with Dead Mouse in year two, Skrillex in year three. That was, by the way, a party that was amazing. Uh, you know, this, that was the first time that Skrillex ever did sort of a non-public uh, sort of DJ set, and, and he totally rocked it. Last year, this massive party with Zed, uh, and I think we had a great fun uh, last year. There's something that these, um, that these DJs have in common, or actually that they don't have in common and that we need to transform. They are not Dutch. Yeah, if you look at sort of the, the list of big DJs over time, all of them have been Dutch. And whether it's Hartwell, whether it's Armin van Buren, whether it's Tiesto, whether it's Afrojack, all of those have been Dutch. Yeah? And it's time for us to go Dutch. Yeah? But even, even among the Dutch, the transformations are happening. And DJ Magazine, which is the magazine that actually tracks the biggest DJs in the world and ranks them, yeah, has ranked this kid as the number one DJ in the world. And tonight, Martin Garrix will be playing at our party. I'll see you there tonight. If I told you this was only gonna hurt If I warned you that the fire's gonna burn Would you walk in? Would you let me do it first? Do it all in the name of love Would you let me lead you even when you're blind In the darkness, in the middle of the night In the silence, when there's no one by your side Would you call? 